Now we've talked a lot about what's controlling the rate of ventilation, we should turn our attention to talking a little bit about the airflow. The airflow refers to the amount of air that's coming in and out of the lungs when we breathe in and when we breathe out. The airflow depends on two factors. It depends on the pressure difference, meaning the difference between the pressure in the lungs and the pressure in the surrounding air, and it also depends on the resistance how hard or easy it is to get air in and out of the lungs. The pressure difference directly affects the airflow. So the bigger the pressure difference, the more airflow you're going to have. So if you have a small difference between the pressure in your lungs and the pressure in the surrounding air, you're going to have a small amount of airflow. So if I only expand my lungs a little bit and make a little pressure difference in there, a little air will come in. If we have a big pressure difference, between the air in the lungs and the surrounding air, then we're going to have a lot of air movement. On the other hand, the resistance has an inverse relationship to the airflow, meaning the more resistance you have, the less airflow you're going to have. And the resistance refers to anything that's going to make it more difficult to get air flowing into or out of the lungs. I want to look at these two factors separately. So we're going to start by looking a little bit at the pressure difference, and then we'll talk a bit about the resistance. We already looked at the pressure difference because that's what we use to get air in and out of our lungs when we're breathing in and out. So we talked quite a bit about how we can control the pressure in the lungs, and we control the pressure in the lungs by controlling the volume of the thoracic cavity. So bigger thoracic cavity gives us lower pressure in the lungs, smaller thoracic cavity gives us higher pressure in the lungs. That's how we get the air to move in and out. There is a little bit to be said for the pressure that's going on in the surrounding air. While we can't really change it, I can't just change the pressure in this room, there are situations where the surrounding air pressure can change. For example, at high altitudes, you go up to a very high altitude, there's lower air pressure up there. What that means is that the surrounding air has a lower pressure. It makes it more difficult to breathe in because in order to get good airflow into my lungs, I have to decrease the pressure in my lungs even lower than the low air pressure at a high altitude. So it's a little bit harder to get the air in. However, it's easier to get the air back out again because the surrounding air pressure is already low. So when I increase the pressure in my lungs, I'm going to have a big pressure difference and the air will come out easily. You could see the opposite effect if you go somewhere where you're in a highly pressured situation. So uh, let's say you want to go deep sea diving and you're going way down uh, low and there's going to be increased pressure. And if the pressure in the surrounding air goes up, it's going to be easier to breathe in. Because when you expand your rib cage, you're going to have a low pressure inside and a higher pressure outside. Air will rush in. You'll get good airflow in. But it'll be harder to breathe out. Because to breathe out, you're going to have to make the pressure in your lungs even higher than the high surrounding air. So it'll be harder to breathe out even if it's easier to breathe in. Personally, I like a nice sea level where it's easy to breathe out and easy to breathe in. The resistance is affected by a number of factors, but one of the main things that affects the resistance to the flow of air in and out of the lungs is the same thing that affected resistance to the flow of blood through the blood vessels, and that is the diameter. We had more resistance in smaller blood vessels and less resistance in bigger blood vessels. And we see the same thing when we're looking at the air passages in the lungs. If we have wider air passages, there will be lower resistance. And if we have narrower air passages, there will be higher resistance. The diameter of your um, bronchi and bronchioles is controlled by a layer of smooth muscle around those air passages. When that smooth muscle constricts, when it contracts, then the opening of the airway gets narrower. We have what's called bronchoconstriction. When that smooth muscle relaxes, the airways get wider, and that's called bronchodilation. There are a lot of factors that affect the smooth muscle that controls the diameter of your airways. 
One of the important things that controls the diameter of your airways is your sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system causes bronchodilation. So your sympathetic neurons send signals to the smooth muscle around your airways to relax and allow those airways to dilate. And remember, the sympathetic nervous system is associated with increased activity. And if you're going to have increased activity, you want increased airflow. That means you want to reduce the resistance, and we do that by dilating the airways. In addition to the sympathetic nervous system, epinephrine, the hormone, also has an effect that's going to dilate your airways. Bronchoconstriction or the contraction of those smooth muscles can also be caused by a number of factors. It's caused by the parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system, remember, helps you rest and digest. Well, when you're resting and you don't need a large amount of airflow, we constrict the bronchi and the bronchioles, and what that does is reduces the amount of dead space, the amount of just uh, air that's in our bronchi and bronchioles that can't exchange oxygen only the air actually in the lungs, in the alveoli, can exchange oxygen. So we have less dead air in the airways and get more of the air down to the alveoli for air exchange. Other things that can cause bronchoconstriction would be things uh, like cold air. I'm sure you've felt that before. We go out on a really cold day and you take a deep breath of that cold air and suddenly it's really hard to breathe because that cold air goes in, stimulates contraction of the smooth muscle to um, try and keep cold air out of your lungs, and you have really high resistance and lower airflow. If you remember to close your mouth and breathe through your nose, which has a better warming effect due to the nasal conchi, then you should be able to keep your bronchioles and bronchi wider and get better airflow even in cold situations. Irritants also cause constriction of the airways. So we talked before about irritants causing faster, slower breathing. Along with that, we get bronchoconstriction, again, to keep the irritants from being pulled too deeply into the lungs. We'll re increase the resistance, and that's gonna reduce the airflow so we're not pulling them in. A second factor that affects the resistance to airflow is something called the pulmonary compliance. The pulmonary compliance refers to how easily your lungs expand. If your lungs expand easily, then there's not going to be much resistance to airflow. You'll have low resistance and that will give you higher airflow. If your lungs don't expand very well, that's going to give you higher resistance and less airflow. Anything that damages the lungs can lead to pulmonary fibrosis, which is scarring in the lung tissue. That's going to make the tissues stiffer so they won't expand as well. So any damage to the lung tissue will reduce your compliance. That's going to cause more resistance and less airflow. A third important factor in resistance is surface tension. Your lungs are a moist tissue, so there's water there, and water has surface tension because, of course, water molecules are attracted to each other. What can happen is if you have high surface tension in the lungs, the water molecules on the sides of the alveoli are attracted to each other, and they actually can cause the alveoli to collapse. Once the alveoli are collapsed, it's hard to break that surface tension to get them to open back up again. So surface tension in this case is a bad thing. The higher the surface tension in the alveoli, the more resistance you can have and the less airflow. In order to reduce the surface tension in the alveoli, we have some special cells that are called the great alveolar cells because they're just great. And these great alveolar cells produce something called surfactant. Surfactant lines and coats the inside of the alveoli and it reduces the surface tension. Surfactant in the lungs reduces the surface tension so that the alveoli stay open instead of collapsing. That's going to reduce the resistance and give you better airflow. One of the problems with premature infants is that their lungs haven't matured enough to begin producing a lot of surfactant. 
So if you have a baby who's born very early, they don't have a lot of surfactant in their lungs and it makes it incredibly hard for them to overcome the resistance to pull air into their lungs. One last factor that's pretty important for resistance would be obstruction of the airflow. Anything that obstructs the flow of air through the bronchial tree, through the trachea, and through the bronchi and the bronchioles is going to increase the resistance. Any obstruction from uh, choking on a hard candy, that's going to block the trachea and cause huge resistance and dramatically reduced airflow, to the buildup of mucus inside the lungs. So if people have a lot of mucus buildup in the lungs, um, people with cystic fibrosis have a lot of trouble with this. They have a lot of um, mucus that builds up in their lungs and reduces their airflow. And inflammation can play the same role. If you have inflammation and swelling along those airways, that's obstructing the airways, that's going to cause higher resistance and lower airflow.